Thank you so much, Tim. There's a, a passage in, I think it's in, uh, it's in first or second Corinthians. Forgive me for not taking a moment to look it up. But it's talking about a group of people that gave an offering, a financial offering for the help of another church. And Paul commends them when he says this. He says, they first gave their own selves. Now, money is a wonderful gift. It really is. And uh, it represents a portion of your life. You work, you spend your time, your resources to give money. So in a, in a sense, it represents a portion of your life. But the greatest thing you can give to any cause is to give yourself, to give yourself, to give your time, to give your talent, even greater than your money. And many people at First Bible Baptist Church do that. They put themselves in the offering plate. That is, they work with our children in our nurseries, our child care, our Sunday schools, our WANA program, our sports ministries, and, and the like. And that's just beginning to touch the hem of the garment of all of the people that volunteer at First Bible. So I want to, as your pastor, I want to say thank you to you for giving you, for giving yourself, for putting yourself, in a sense, in the offering plate. We appreciate that. And this church, although we, the church is successful when it comes to finances, and it is, and we're thankful to you for your giving, there is nothing more important than the people that give themselves for all of the ministries. We couldn't afford to pay all the people that do all of the things that make First Bible Baptist Church what it is. I would like to say uh, something uh, about uh, Annabelle Hines. Some of you know Annabelle, uh, one of our young ladies at North Star, was selected as the Democrat and Chronicle High School Athlete of the Week because she had, uh, yes, she deserves it. She had scored 42 points in a game which tie, which set the girl's record and was, a, was a, if she would have scored one more point, more point, she would have set the school record. Well, what did she do later after she received the reward? She scored 43 points against Finney and uh, set the school record for boys and girls at North Star. So I just want to congratulate Annabelle on what a great, uh, she's a great young lady and a great accomplishment at North Star. Thank you. This morning we have a guest speaker. If you took a moment to read through your bulletin, uh, you're aware that uh, we're going to have Sergeant Gary Bikirk speak to us this morning, but I want to give him uh, the right kind of introduction. I want to read to you as he uh, comes in just a moment the citation that he received for uh, receiving the Congressional Medal of Honor. For conspicuous gallantry, and intrepidity in action at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty. Sergeant Bykirk, medical aidman, detachment B-24, Company B, distinguished himself during the defense of Camp Dak Seng. The Allied defenders suffered a number of casualties as a result of an intense, devastating attack launched by the enemy from well-concealed positions surrounding the camp. Sergeant Bykirk, with complete disregard for his personal safety, moved unhesitatingly through the, with, the withering, enemy, uh, withering enemy fire to his fallen comrades, applied first aid to their wounds, and Bykirk ran immediately through the, hall, uh, the hail of fire. Although he was wounded seriously by fragments from an exploding enemy mortar shell, Sergeant Biker carried the officer in, uh, to a medical aid station. Ignoring his own serious injuries, Sergeant Biker left the relative safety of the medical bunker to search for and evacuate other men who had been injured. He was again wounded as he dragged a critically injured Vietnamese soldier to the medical bunker while simultaneously applying mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation to sustain his life. Sergeant Biker again refused treatment and continued his search for other casualties until he collapsed. Only then did he permit himself to be, re to be treated. I think when you collapse, you have to give in at that time, <laughs> as I read that, that's for sure. Only then did he permit himself to be treated. 
Sergeant Bykirk's complete devotion to the welfare of his comrades at the risk of his life are in keeping with the highest traditions of, the mili of military service and reflect great credit on him, his unit, and the U.S. Army. There are 77 living recipients of the Congressional Medal of Honor. 54 of those 77 received the Congressional Medal as a result of their action in uh, the Vietnam War. It is an honor to have our own, he's a deacon in our church, uh, taught at North Star many years ago, retired counselor here in the town of Greece, counselor for the public high schools in the town of Greece. It is an honor to have Sergeant Gary Bykirk here this morning to speak to us, and I'm gonna ask you to do this. Would you stand with me and welcome Sergeant Bykirk, please. Gary. Thank you. Okay, got to get my bearings, look, look at the clock. <laughs> uh, I need to kind of ramble for a couple minutes because um, every time I hear the citation being read, you know, I hear more than the, just the words that are being spoken. I still hear explosions. <laughs> I still kind of hear screams. Things in that will never, never leave me. But as I was re hearing the citation again, I remembered that uh, even with something as special as a Medal of Honor citation, those of us that are in the military know that as a rule, the military always messes up with something. And even with a citation for the Medal of Honor, they messed up. Because you may not have heard it, but I heard it because as Pastor read the citation, it said that Sergeant Biker moved unhesitatingly through withering fields of fire. Now, I don't know who wrote this citation up, but I sure know he wasn't there because <laughs> <laughs> unhesitatingly is not a word that I would have used to describe uh, what was going on that particular day, April 1st, 1970. Uh, seems like a long time ago for some, maybe, but for me it just seems very, very recent. Um, as I was walking up here, I was, I was thinking of what, you know, over the years, there's been a lot of places that I've been, and it's been a wonderful blessing and met many wonderful, wonderful people in all the places that my wife and I have been blessed to be able to attend, but um, it's not very often that you get asked to come and to speak to the place that you call home speak to a group of people who have been such a special part of your life. And uh, so how did I end up here? Well, last Monday, after pastor's message about when life isn't worth living, I just sent him an email. And I said, I thanked him for his message, thanked him for the encouragement, and I thanked him for uh, the insight to life that he shared in that message. And many things that he shared reminded me of my own journey of faith. And so I just wanted him to thank, you know, to know that I appreciated it and thanked him. So then I get an email back and say, hey, you want to preach? <laughs> <laughs> so here I am. That's how I got up here. But it is a special honor and a privilege to be able to speak to those, those people that have meant so much to me over the years and to our family. Um, before I go too farther, further up, uh, I want to introduce my wife, Lolly, and my other granddaughters. One of my granddaughters. Annabelle Hines is one of our granddaughters, but that's my other granddaughter, Madeline. Um, because when I, I want to speak about a journey today. When Slava and Andy asked me, they say, you got a title for your message? And I thought, Man, I don't put titles on things. It's kind of hard to come to one. But I just said, yeah, put it down as a, a soldier's journey. And then taking off on pastor's message last week about when life isn't worth living, I said, put down a soldier's journey, finding a life worth living. And Lolly has definitely been 
uh, a big part of that journey. And so I just wanted, especially those in the first service, since we usually don't attend the first service, some of you may not know my wife. Um, some of you probably don't even know me. That's why I wore the same coat that's in the picture, so you'd recognize it. this is me. You know? <laughs> but I'd like to start out with a prayer first, okay? Father, we do just thank you for the journey that each of us have taken. We thank you for your love that surrounds us as we journey, as we go through this life. Father, we thank you for the people that have been a blessing that we have met on this journey. And Father, now as I begin to share, I pray that you would just clear my heart, clear my mind. As we sang this morning, Lord, open up the floodgates. May we hear you. May people only see you. May you be glorified in all that's done and said here this morning. For it's in Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. Like I said, we've had the privilege of being going to some many, many wonderful places and, and blessings, but I'm sure many of you have experienced a situation where you say, gee, I know where I was planning on going, but I ended up here, and I don't know how I got here. You know? And Lolly and I have been blessed to be in so many wonderful places, but there have been those times, too, where you say, oh, my gosh, man, I didn't expect this. How did I get here? For me, one of the scariest places I ever ended up in was in a seventh grade classroom, working with middle school students. As Pastor said, I just retired after working 33 years with middle school students. And I always felt after my first week, which I began my career working with young people at North Star, taught there for eight years. And I remember after the first week thinking, my gosh, Vietnam was sure good training for working with middle school kids. <laughs> I learned an awful lot uh, in Vietnam that would help me working with middle school kids. But I have this story that I, I always like to tell. I love this story. Um, it's an illustration of my journey and what it's been like. This took place long before GPS was in, and we used to use things called the MapQuest. And we were scheduled to go down to Altoona, PA, and speak to a church. Now, I never even knew that there was an Altoona PA. I'd never heard of it before. So I did a map quest on it and got the directions, printed it out, and Lolly and I left to go down to Altoona PA. And we weren't driving too long before Lolly sensed that there was something wrong. The longer you've been married to a person, the more you have these senses that occur between you. And she looked at me and she said, what's wrong? And I said, nothing, nothing. And she looking and she goes, do you have the directions, don't you? I said, eh, no, I left them on the table. And she said, well, it was too far to turn around. She said, well, you better stop and find a map or something like that to, to get us to Altoona. And I said, I'm a Green Beret. Yeah. I don't need a map. I got it here. I saw the picture. I got the vision, hon. Trust me, I can get you there. Well, it was a quiet ride to Altoona, PA, because she wasn't buying into my, my vision. Um, but I figured... We live in New York, Pennsylvania South. I just head south. I got to hit it sometime. You know. <laughs> Fortunately, they have road signs, and we got into some highways, and I saw a sign that said, I'll tune it this way. So I kind of looked over and smiled at her and kind of said, and I didn't really say anything because I didn't want to make things worse, but I gave her that look like, I told you, I told you I'd get you where I want to go. Well, she didn't, still wasn't buying into it. And so we got to Altoona, and I saw the sign that said, Welcome to Altoona on the freeway. And she goes, Do you know where we have to go now? And I said, Yeah, the Marriott Hotel. And she said, Do you know where the Marriott Hotel is? And I said, How big can Altoona PA be? You know, <laughs> I, I got it easy to find the Marriott Hotel. Well, she wasn't still buying into my vision, but I still was not going to stop and ask for directions, which is what she kept asking me to do. But God heard my prayer. And all of a sudden, I saw this sign on the roadside, this big sign that said, oh, you know, the Marriott Hotel. And I said, and I, again, I didn't say anything. I just looked at it with a smile. The thing is, is that I got off the expressway to head towards the Marriott sign. It kept getting further and further away. And she just said, Gary, would you please just stop and ask for directions? It's been a long ride. I just want to rest. And I said, trust me, hon. 
Well, after going the wrong way on a one-way street, I finally decided to stop and ask for directions. I, I asked this guy, I said, see that sign? He said, yeah. I said, I want to go there. Can you get me to that sign? He said, sure. He gave me some right and left turns. And so I got back in the car, feeling a little bit humbled, but still reveling in the fact that I got us here without asking for directions. So we made the right-hand turns, left-hand turns, and we were pulling up to, and I saw the sign at the end of the road, and I, so I pulled up to the sign, pulled into a parking spot, put it in park, and I just kind of sat there for a minute, really quietly, but I could feel her looking at me. She was looking at me because all that was there was the Marriott sign. There was no hotel there. <laughs> I don't know if it moved or if they just had that sign there as a joke. I don't know what, but there was no Marriott Hotel. It was just a sign. Which kind of illustrates my journey. You see, there's, I'm sure all of us had those surprises like that. You know, we think we're going somewhere. We got, we got that vision, you know. I know what I'm doing. And then we get there and we go, wow, this isn't what I expected. Is life like that for you sometimes? This isn't what I expected. It's not part of my plan. Well, God gives us some help in those things. He gives us his word to give us some direction. And there's a verse in Proverbs that says, there is a way that seems right unto a man. There's a way that seems right. You think you know where you're going, but the end is death. I thought I knew where I was going, but it sure didn't turn out that way. Elizabeth, Elizabeth Elliot is a fine Christian lady writer. She wrote a, wrote a book, and in the book there was this quote that says, it is God to whom and with whom we travel. And while he is the end of the journey, he is also with us at every stopping place. We're all on a journey, and it's to God that we travel. And on this travel, on this journey, God travels with us. And not only is he at the end of the journey, but he's at every stopping place. And the stopping place is a place where sometimes where we pull off the road, we kind of refresh, we reorient ourselves, make sure we got the right bearings. A stopping place is where I should have pulled off when I was trying to find the Marriott Hotel, just to kind of get refreshed, renew, refocus. Am I going in the right direction? God is at not only the end of our journey, but he's at every stopping place along our journey. Well, my life has been a journey. And by the grace of God, it's been a life worth living now. You see, I, I thought that I had a plan. I thought I had a dream. I thought I had a vision, just like I knew where the motel was. I had a vision for my life. And that vision was I was gonna become a Green Beret. I was, had this dream of being a green brain medic, of just helping people. And I achieved that. And in doing so, there were many, many challenges and training that I had to go through, many accomplishments. But I achieved being a green beret. I was a professional soldier. I was not only a green beret, but I was living in Vietnam. I was living with a group of people called mountain yards in the jungles of Vietnam in the highlands. 3,000 people, I was responsible for them. What a beautiful, beautiful dream had come true for me. Vietnam was like my Shangri-La. I couldn't have asked for a better life, a better place to be. You know, now people pay $7,000 to go on vacations and tour Vietnam. I was there and they were paying me 300 bucks a month to be there. You know, aside from the firefights, the snakes, and the tigers, it was a beautiful, beautiful place. I, I loved it there. I thought I achieved everything that I had hoped for. Like I said, I was living my dream, my vision. But there was this sign that was in the team house that always used to puzzle me. Because that sign said, to really live, you must almost die. To those that fight for it, life has a meaning the protected will never know. I used to think, well, what does that mean? I'm living. I don't really need to die. I'm really living now. I couldn't ask for anything more. But I did learn the truth of that sign and that saying and that motto. April 1st, 1970. Now, most times people really want to hear about the battle. They want to hear, 
You know, what was it like to be surrounded by 10,000 of the enemy? What was it like to get shot three times? What was it like to be in hand-to-hand -hand combat? What was it like to get overrun and have B-52 strikes in on your camp? What was that like? Was that terrible? Was it scary? And they're kind of surprised when I say, eh, piece of cake. <laughs> and they say, what? And I go, you want me to tell you what the worst battle I fought was? The worst battle I fought happened a week later when I woke up in a hospital bed in Vietnam. I woke up and I started to do a quick examination of myself. I had been shot three times. And when I had a chance to examine myself, there were things that were on the outside that used to be on the inside of me. <laughs> they were just out there healing. I had tubes going into every part of my body, some openings I had never had before. I had blood dripping into my veins that if it weren't for that, I would have died. But that wasn't the scariest part. The scariest part was fighting going unconscious going unconscious, losing control. Now, I had been unconscious before in college plenty of times, you know, but this was different. You know. I fought to stay conscious. And what did I fight with? I fought with the same weapons that I brought that had made me successful in achieving the, being a Green Beret. I, the weapons that I had to fight were my determination, my perseverance, my skills, my strength. Those were the weapons that I brought to fight going unconscious. There's a verse in Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 8.8. 8. It says, there is no man that has power to retain his spirit. Neither has he power in the day of death. And there's no discharge in that war. I was living the truth of that verse. I was in a hand-to-hand -hand combat, not with another person, but I was in hand-to-hand -hand combat with death. I fought very hard, but my mind kept on going back to that sign. To those who fight for it, life has a meaning the protected will never know. Elizabeth Elliot talked about stopping places. This was one of those stopping places for me, that hospital bed. Life got my attention at that point. And what happened was life began to take on a new meaning to me in that hospital bed. Because what was happening was is that I was going to die. There was nothing that I could do, nothing that I had that could keep myself from going unconscious. I was in a war and I was about to be discharged. And I said that special forces had given me quite a few skills to battle with, quite a few skills to fight with, but it also gave me a new mindset. It gave me kind of an attitude that said, what man can do, man, what man has done, man can do. I can do it. All I have to do is work hard. Don't, don't quit. You can do it. Well, as I was battling death in that hand-to-hand -hand situation, I began to realize that I needed something more important than what I had. I learned a lesson about life. And that life lesson that I've carried with me on my journey is that in life, what happens in you is more important than what happens to you. As we go through this life, when we go through different experiences, what happens in you is much more important than what happens to you. What was happening in me in that hospital bed? I was dying. All that I was, all that I had, all that I dreamed, all that I believed in, all that was dying. I was losing confidence in myself. I was losing confidence in my dream. I was losing confidence in what I could do. All that I had trusted in, all that I had depended upon that had brought me success in the past wasn't working. Last week when Pastor read 2 Corinthians 1, 8, and 9, I thought about my hospital bed experience. 
2 Corinthians 1, 8 and 9 said, it's where Paul wrote and he said, we would not have you ignorant, brethren, of our trouble that came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, that we despaired even of life. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raises the dead. I had the sentence of death. Death was ready to give me my discharge papers and say, you're out. But I couldn't trust in God because I didn't know God. I could only trust in myself. And myself was dying. And I had this conversation with death, and death mockingly said to me, think you can handle it, Gary? Think you can handle dying? All the things that I had accomplished before to that point didn't help me a bit because I knew that I couldn't handle dying. I didn't want to die. My self was dying and I realized that I needed something greater than who I was. I needed something that was greater than self. I needed something outside of myself. What was happening in me was my life was being redefined. I was being prepared to meet God face to face. What was happening in me I was being humbled. Self was dying. Well, one of those times that I came to, I looked and I saw a chaplain who was walking around the ward. And he was praying with guys. And he came up to my bed and he said, son, I'm glad to see you're awake. I said, sir, I'm glad to be awake. <laughs> I said, you wouldn't believe what I just went through. You know? I had this conversation with death and I'm kind of scared, you know. And he said, would you like to pray? I said, sir, I don't know how to pray. I don't even know who to pray to. But he said, that's okay, son. God knows how to listen. He handed me a cross. And I said a prayer. As I said, I'd never prayed before. I didn't even know who to pray to. But I said a prayer. I said, God, now you're not going to find this prayer in any book of great prayers. I mean, it's not very theologically sound, and it's not, you know, it's not wordy, it's not flowery speech. I just said, God, if you're real, I need you. If you're real, I need you. You know, I read, read once that when people go through some of the trials that life throws in your way, when people are challenged more than they can take, and life will do that to you. But at those times, you look not so much for the proof of the existence of God. Rather, you look for the presence of God. At that hospital bed, I didn't talk with a chaplain about well, you know, sir, I don't really know if there's a God. Can you tell me, can you prove to me that there is a God before I pray to him? When people are going through hard times, they don't look for the proof of the presence of God. I want to know, God, are you here right now with me? That's what I need to know. If you're real, God, I need you right now. What happened was I discovered something that was real. I discovered something that was outside of myself. I discovered something that was greater than the fear that I was feeling, greater than the death that I was in hand to hand with. I found something that was outside of myself that was able to bring calmness to what was going on inside of me. I discovered something that was more real than the death that, fa that I faced. And it was to, could change what was happening inside of me. Something out there could come to here and change what was happening in me. What was happening in me at this time? Faith was being born. The presence of God was entering my life and I experienced something I'd never felt before and that was the power of the love of God. I knew that God was real. A British theologian said that when you have nothing left but God, 
then for the first time you become aware that he is enough. He's all you need. When you have nothing left, I had nothing left. But when you have nothing left, you become aware that God is all you need. In life, what happens in you is more important than what happens to you. And there are some terrible things that can happen to us in life, terrible trials and challenges that we can face, many, many experiences that are, will bring us to a point in our life where we go beyond ourselves. We've reached the end. We have nowhere else to go. And so we look for something outside of ourselves that's greater than self, greater than the strength that we have, greater than any philosophical trendy beliefs that we might have picked up from watching Dr. Phil or these other things about life. We need something greater than positive thinking, as Pastor mentioned last week. We need something greater than a stiff, keep a stiff upper lip. We need something greater because life is hard and it challenges us. And I wonder if life is worth living. Give me something greater, God. I need you to prove that life has a meaning, that it's worth living. In that hospital bed, I experienced God. I realized my need for God. What happens in you is more important than what happens to you. Life will take you to that point where you realize you need God. That was my stopping place. That's what I realized. And now I needed him. And he came to me, and I knew he was real. But that's not the end of the story because knowing God is real is not the same as knowing God. I knew he was real and I wanted to know him. This God who was able to do such miraculous things, who was able to give me a peace that passes understanding, who could give me a peace even though I was dying. I didn't, I didn't, I can't say I didn't care, but I wasn't worried because I knew that there was a God who cared for me. And I wanted to know him. I wanted to know him intimately. I found out that he wanted to know me that way too. And as I searched for him, my search led me to a, a friend in Massachusetts who said, Gary, do you value our friendship? I said, sure I do. You're the best thing I've got to a friend. And he said, if you value our friendship, do me a favor, read this book, will you? I said, sure. So I started reading it. It was kind of funny because the first chapter was called Matthew. You know. So I started reading it. I read that, I read Mark. Then I went back and I said, hey, Buck, what kind of book is this? You know, it's the same story, you know. He said, just keep reading, Gary, just keep reading. I got to Luke, got to John. I started reading the 14th chapter of John. And I read these words. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God? Yeah, I believe in God, because I met him in a hospital bed. I know there's a God. Believe also in me, Gary. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, Gary. I went to John 15, where in verse 9 it says, As the Father has loved me, Gary, so have I loved you. 13th verse says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. The 15th verse says, Gary, I'm your friend. 16th verse says, Gary, you have not chosen me, but I've chosen you. I want you. I've chosen you. Well, the Spirit of God and the Word of God went to work on me. And faith was born, because faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So on July 2nd, 1972, at 3 o'clock in the morning, I knelt down in a trailer and accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. But even though I was a Christian at that time, I still faced a lot of battles. You see, because war challenges who you are. War challenges what you believe about yourself, what you believe about life. War challenges what you value. It challenges how you feel. 
It challenges how you relate with other people. And war challenged me. I came back from war different. I came back changed. Things that I valued, I didn't value anymore. I came back with an inability to control some very, very strong feelings. And some bad experiences happened, and I got in some issues with people. And so I said, that's it, I'm out of here. And so I sought the, the solitude, the safety, and the security of a cave in northern New Hampshire, in the White Mountains. I lived in that cave for two years, trying to make sense out of that war, trying to make sense out of what had happened to me. Into that cave, I took with me three things. I took my Bible, I took a journal, and I took my guitar. I said, that's it. I want to work on my relationship with God now. Well, in that cave, that was another stopping place for me. It's another place where I had a conversation with God. And I remember saying in September of 1973, God, you gave me my life back to me in Vietnam. Now I give my life to you. I know that without you I am nothing. So I give my life to you. Whatever you want from my life, that's what I want. September 73, I made that prayer. Two weeks later, I was notified that I was being awarded the Medal of Honor. Sometimes God works pretty fast. He had a plan. And it's, it's a funny thing because when I mentioned that I lived in a cave, you know, most people want to, have, want to know more about that cave. You know, a Green Beret, Vietnam, Medal of Honor, they don't care about that. Say, what was the cave like? You know? What was it like to live there? Did you like it? Did you see any wild animals? You know, what'd you eat? You know, all those kinds of questions. And then one time somebody asked me, he said, what brought you out of the cave? And I thought about it and I said, well, first thing, my wife. <laughs> you see, I fell in love with this girl down in Lancaster, New Hampshire, and I loved her and I wanted her to marry me. But she said, if I marry you, I'm not going into the cave. <laughs> <laughs> what brought me out of that cave? My wife. And for 40 years, we've been together with 14 grandchildren, and she's been on my journey for 40 years. But the other thing that brought me out of that cave was a message. See, during that time that I was living in the cave, a message began to form within my heart. And it wasn't easy to come out of the cave because I fell in love with God in that cave. Those were two years of falling in love with God, and I was enjoying life in that cave. And then one day, God said to me, Gary, do you love me? Sure, you know I do, God. Come out of the cave. Ah, oh, I don't know, God. Gary, do you love me? Come out of the cave. Oh, God, it's nice in here. It's nice and safe, you know. It's just you and me. Can't we stay a little bit longer? We'll get to know each other a little bit better. And, and it'll be, I'll be like David. You know, David spent quite a bit of time in the cave, God. And besides that, people out there don't like me. <laughs> and quite honestly, I don't know if I like anybody out there either, God. So let's just stay in the cave. No, Gary, do you love me? By this time, I kind of felt like Peter when God was asking Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. One time he asked me, Gary, do you love me? Then come out of the cave. I've got a plan for you. Okay, what's your plan, God? I want you to tell your story. And really, my story is his story. So I came out of the cave, and for 40 years I've been telling his story. His story about this Medal of Honor. You see, this Medal of Honor is not about me. It's not about what I've done. But it has opened so many doors that have allowed me the opportunity to share what God has done. And that this medal is about him. You see, without God's grace, I never would have survived Vietnam. 
without his forgiveness in my life, I would not be able to live with myself nor live with others. Without his love, I would never have healed from the war's wounds. This medal is about him, and I wear it for his honor. Now, in those 40 years, there's been many, many challenges that have tested my faith. Those challenges have tested my beliefs, what I believe about God. But more than that, what each of those challenges have done is they've just been opportunities for God to prove to me who he is. My ideas about God have changed. God hasn't changed. But in my journey with him, I'm learning more and more about who he really is. And at this point in my life, I know that he's more than just my Lord and my Savior. I know that he is my hope when I have no hope left. I know that he's my guide when I can't see through that fog of battle and I don't know where to make the next step. He's there to lead me. I know that he's my friend when I don't think that there's anybody left that understands or even wants to be a friend with me. God is much more than just my Lord and Savior now. And he's there with me in this journey at every stopping place. My favorite verse is Nahum 1.3 that says that God has his way in the whirlwinds and in the storms. You're going through some storms. You're going through the whirlwind, a tornado. Is your life being lifted, carried upside down? God has his way in those whirlwinds and storms. And the clouds are just the dust of his feet. That verse has brought me so much comfort as we've gone through many of the challenges that we've faced in life, whether it's been Lolly's cancer, deaths in the family, disappointment, rejections. Those clouds have just been the dust of God's feet. He's with us at every stopping place. Also in that cave, I learned some other lessons, and life has taught me lessons. I shared one of them with you is that in life, what's more, what happens in you is more important than what happens to you. But I want to close with sharing one other lesson that I learned. And I used to share this with middle school students. They used to say, yeah, these are Mr. B's life lessons. And that life lesson is this. That in life, there's a big difference between success and significance. In life, there's a big difference between success and significance. At this point in my life, I'm now 68, I never planned on living more than till 30, so every day has been a real blessing. But I've learned at this point in my life that there's a big difference between success and significance. And at this point, when I reflect back on my life, what matters to me? Is it success? You know, sex, success is just about personal accomplishments. It's about personal achievements. It's, it's about what have you been able to accumulate in life, what you've been able to attain. Success is more of a focus on me and what I have done. And I have learned that self is very, very fleeting. Fame, very, very fleeting. It doesn't last. I've learned that no matter how much success you've achieved, how much prestige or power or wealth you may have accumulated for yourself in this life, that your life will never achieve significance apart from God. You see, significance in life truly comes from God. As Pastor said at the beginning, the greatest thing is to just give yourself to God. You want significance in life? You want something that will last? Give yourself to God. Significance in life does not come any other way except through God. Significance in life comes when you know who God is. Significance in life comes when you know how much God loves you and how much he cares about you and how often he thinks about you. David in the Psalms 139, he said, God, if I, how precious are your thoughts towards me. If I should count them, they are more than the sand. It's comforting to me to think about those times that I know God's thinking of me. He knows what I'm going through. He knows where I am. 
And that's what significance is. Significance is knowing that where you are and when you're, when you're there, God is there with you. Significance in life is knowing that what happens in you is more important than what happens to you. It's knowing that, okay, some parts of you may die, but that's okay. Because Jesus said, he that loses his life for my sake shall find life. It's okay because that's part of his plan. It's part of him making me into who he wants me to be. It's part of his plan to make this life worth living. Significance in life comes when you begin to share what God has done for you. When you start to use the gifts and the talents that God has given you, and then through the power and the grace and the love of God, you start to make a difference in the lives of others. Lolly and I read a book once that really made a difference in our lives. It was written by John Maxwell. And in that book, he said, do you want to make a difference? It was called The Difference Maker. Do you want to make a difference in people's lives? Then I ask you this question then. When was the first time, or when was the last time you did something for the first time? Do you want to make a difference in people's lives? When was the last time you did something for the first time? Significance is being a difference maker in someone's life. Remember I said that people always want to know about caves and what that's about? I was thinking about it this morning, and maybe that's because so many of us want to find a cave ourselves to go into. Things are happening to us, and we want to get to that cave. We want peace. We want solitude. We want security. And so we try to find a cave, and sometimes we make a cave. We build our own emotional walls. We build psychological barriers to keep us from others. We get into a little comfort zone, and we stay there because we feel safe. Significance is coming out of your cave. I challenge you to come out of your cave. Come out of your comfort zones. It can be scary, but realize that God is there with you. He's there to lead you to a life of significance. He's there to help you make a difference in other people's lives. Significance in life is letting your story become his story. Significance is loving God, loving people, serving others, and telling everyone. You want a life worth living? You want a life of significance? Love God, love people, serve others, and tell everyone. In life, there is a big difference between success and significance. You want to know what the difference is between success and significance is? The difference is between finding the Marriott sign and finding the Marriott hotel. <laughs> That's the difference in life. Do you want to end up at the sign or do you want to end up at the hotel? A life of significance is finding the hotel. Now, I don't want to present myself as some kind of super spiritual person here because I haven't, I haven't found the hotel yet either. You know? Please don't get the idea that I'm anything more than anybody else here. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. But I see the hotel. I see it, and I want to go there. And wanting to go there makes my life worth living. I realize that like Paul said in Philippians, it's not as though I had already attained. Either we're already perfect, but I follow after it. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I see that prize, and I keep after it. That's what makes my life worth living. It's God to whom and with whom we travel. And while he is the end of the journey, he is also at every stopping place. I don't know where you are on your journey. I don't know if this is a stopping place today. But I do know that God is at the end of our journey. And I do know that there will come a day when we'll meet him and see him face to face. Are you ready? Are you ready to meet God face to face? Are you ready to have a conversation with him? And will that conversation be 
welcome home, thou good and faithful servant? Or will you have a conversation with him as the judge? I don't know where you are in your journey, but I do know that he is at the end. And I do know that he walks with us. I do know that the clouds of the storms that you go through in life are just the clouds of his feet. And I do know that he is at every stopping place. And at every stopping place, he's there to encourage you, to comfort you, to give you strength and hope, to give you everything you need to make it on that journey, to make it to the end of the journey, to see him face to face. And I do that, know that no matter how long you've known the Lord or how well you think you know him, there is so much more to who he is. He wants to know us more intimately than we could ever imagine. There are greater depths of his love, greater depths of his truth that he wants to reveal to us. As 2 Corinthians says, I has not seen nor ear heard the things that God's prepared for those who love him. I do know that he is there to lead. And so I want to encourage you today. First of all, come out of the cave. Become a difference maker. Live a life of significance by making a difference in the lives of others. I want to encourage you that as you walk with God and as you trust him, listen to him because he is there to lead you to a life of significance. As Isaiah said, thy ear will hear a word behind thee saying, this is the way, Gary, walk you in it. I do know that he is there to lead because there is a way that seems right, but the end is death. Significance in, is knowing who God is, knowing that he is the God who is there, knowing that all that you need, whether it's comfort, strength, encouragement, or even forgiveness, is only a simple prayer away. God, I need you. Is today a stopping place for you? Is there a need that you have today? All that you need is only a simple prayer away. Pastor, would you close us in prayer? This is a holy moment. That story is like a, a parable out of the Bible, except it's a true story. The parables in the Bible are parables, stories that Jesus made up because he knew that they would illustrate perfectly the truths that he was trying to convey to his disciples, to his listeners. That story of Gary's life is like a parable from the Bible. It's like God, through his life, wrote that story that he could share that with other people for the rest of his life. There's so much in that story that is so practical, so meaningful to all of us. I thought about that metal around his neck. You think, you know, many of you have been through some difficult times in your life. You got a metal around your neck too. You went through some difficult times and it was in that difficult moment of your life that you met God it may have been the loss of a loved one, it may have been a relationship that fell apart, maybe that you lost your job or you went through a bankruptcy, a personal failure that was totally and completely embarrassing to you, but yet God used that difficult time in your life to wake you up 
to give you an opportunity to be introduced to him, to get to know him. You need to look at your suffering that way. That's what the Bible teaches. What Gary just said is what the Bible teaches about difficult times. For you and I, you know, we start blaming God. We blame other people. Maybe you blame yourself and you just don't get it. But what we just heard is what we're supposed to get. Gary got it. Gary understands. And whatever you're going through today, God wants you to understand too. He wants you to get to know him. He wants you to trust him. And he wants you with your life, with the metal around your neck. He wants you to display that for the glory of God. Say, look what God did for me. You're here this morning and you're not a Christian. It's as easy as reaching out and saying sincerely, God, I need you. That's where it starts. If you don't have any needs, you're not going to go looking for an answer to the problem, whatever. You might not even know what the problem is. Forget about finding the answer. But there is a problem without God. And I, just knowing what I know about people, you've probably sensed that somewhere. Today, your journey may, with God may just start by saying, God, I need you. I want you to stand with me right now. What I want to do is this. You're carrying a burden. You're broken. Maybe you haven't resolved something in your life. It's hanging on. You're resentful. Maybe you're bitter. Maybe you just don't understand. You don't see why God allowed this to happen in your life and what good could really come from it. We want to pray for everybody in this room that's carrying something like that. You're carrying it right now. Maybe it's something that's happened in the past. Maybe you're going through a difficult time. The church wants to pray for you right now. What I want you to do is I want you to come here and line up across the altar and just stay here and let us pray for you. Admit that you're on a journey and you see the difficulty in your life right now, it's a stopping point. God's giving you an opportunity to get to know him really well. Why don't you come on down here? Maybe it's sickness. Maybe it's a loss of some kind. We all lose everything by the time we check out of here. And you're really struggling with what that means in your life. Why don't you come right now? Praise band is going to sing and I want you to come up here and then we'll stop at some point and we'll pray for everybody. But let's do some music while people come and they can pray first, all right? Can we do that? We're kind of changing things to meet the moment. So you come right now. You come. What's your medal around your neck? Well, I got divorced 10 years ago. I've never got over it. That's the medal around your neck. You may look at that as a horrible set of circumstances, kind of like getting shot three times. That's not fun. It's not fun to go through a marriage breakup. It's not fun to lose your job. It's not fun to be publicly humiliated or rejected by your family or by somebody that was important to you. It's not fun. But you know what that is? That's your medal of honor right now. Medal of honor in that God can take that and he can use that to enrich you and help you to get to know him and to tell other people, look, Look where I met God, and look what God did in and through my life. So we're going to have a song. I want everybody to stay right here. At, if you've come up here or you join them, stay right here so we can pray. We're going to sing one song, and then we're going to pray together. All right, David, go ahead.
us to pray for you. You come right now. Just join the people that are up here. You can stand if you're uncomfortable kneeling. I understand it becomes more uncomfortable for me every day too. But if you'd like to stand, you may do that. If you want to join these people, maybe you're going through, maybe you're facing surgery. Maybe you've been diagnosed with something that you didn't like to, you didn't like what you heard from the doctor. Maybe you're facing some financial challenges in your life, relational challenges. Maybe the marriage is going sour. Maybe you've got a child that's going the wrong direction. Remember, it can be your medal of honor. It can be your medal of honor. That's where you meet God. That's where God will help you, help you understand who he is. And from there, you can take that, and that can be your testimony, what God has done in your life. Now, Father, thank you for Gary's message here this morning. It is, to me, I don't know if anybody else was listening, but I listened to every word. And it is a powerful story and a powerful lesson to all of us for what you want to do in every single one of us. Every one of us will be wounded. Every one of us are going to take psychological shrapnel from time to time in life. And every one of those problems are opportunities, stopping places, a place where we can have a little chat with you, Lord, where you can teach us, encourage us to go on the journey with you. And Lord, we, we pray for these that are here at the altar right now in front of us. So many different people and so many different needs represented. God, we need you. We need your strength, your encouragement, and help. Be with each of these individuals. They may be praying for somebody else. They may be burdened about a family member, a child, a parent. Whatever the situation, Lord, would you bring your comfort? You've promised comfort in every single situation. Will you bring your comfort to these people? And will they open their lives, their hearts to you? And then, Lord, they'll come out of their cave. They'll profess what you have taught them and showed them in private. They will gladly display that for the honor and for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray these things today. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Go ahead and be seated. Thank you, Gary. That has to be, well, I say one of, because I can't remember all the sermons I've ever heard, but if that isn't the most powerful sermon I've heard, I don't know which one is that I've heard. I really don't. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gary. God bless you.